Welcome to Slash Forward. It's time to celebrate the holidays or die. If you choose not to, it's important that you're here because we're going to be working our way through some of the best scenes of a very good but very underseen Thanksgiving themed slasher slash home invasion movie that's fraught with adult themes, reckless behavior, and intense or persistent violence. All common Thanksgiving motifs wrapped up in a tight, tense movie that will leave you wondering if you are Christy. To start, we open on a fine piece of American machinery, sporting an ominously open trunk and some nearby fellows, the looks of whom I do not feel good about. Flashbacks and revelations immediately justify our hasty judgments. Then, over some intro credits, we get an exposition about a cultish group hunting down gals referred to as Christy with a K. This isn't their name, but a moniker representative of a type of person based on the name's Latin origin. It's pretty intricate and interesting stuff that naturally ends in a string of serial homicides. We then drop in at uni where the kids are packing up and heading home for the Thanksgiving holiday. Justine hangs back with Aaron because she's still trying to pick apart and piece together her poetry assignment. But Aaron is more interested in the poetry of her body. And since they only have a few more minutes to squeeze one in, they do that instead. Justine still has a class to attend, and since chemistry is her passion, everything else can wait. She's also attending this swanky private school on a work release program, so she has to get her hours in at the wash basin as well. Plus, she's gotta keep it fit. You know how it goes. Outside of that, she abhors the idea of creating a further financial burden for anyone, which is why she informs her mom of her intent to stay on campus with her best friend Nicole. She even rejects an offer from Aaron to come and visit with his family before sending him on his way with his tape recorder, an oddly specific detail that may or may not come into play later. Nope, this weekend's just gonna be the stay behinds and their night guard Wayne. Knowing only the poors don't travel, the school administration doesn't even bother keeping the power running without consistently cycling. But Justine is cautious as she sees danger around every corner, even the ones she doesn't see. She and Nicole head back to the dorm over a backdrop of news reports about the recent missing girls. Regardless, her mind is at ease because their best friends spending the weekend together on campus like they're rooming at Hogwarts during Christmas. Except, and you're gonna hate to hear this, Nicole's father took a break from the campaign trail to surprise the family with a vacay at a luxurious ski resort in Aspen. Nicole offers to get her bestie a ticket, but Justine's compulsion to commit to her financial austerity is pathological at this point. However, she does accept Nicole's keys as a consolation. Then, from that point on, it's literally just Justine. The whole building is empty of students. Literally. But you know what? If you have a healthy internal environment, you can just let your mind run wild. Have fun with it. The world becomes your play place. And what could be more stimulating than the free reign of an expansive environment usually occupied by your fellow human beings? Nothing I can think of. She's just a lady letting loose and learning about her own strengths and limitations. Later on, when she's feeling a bit saucy, she takes Nicole's Beamer for some essentials and promises to hook Wayne up with some pie and a Mountain Dew. She checks in with David at the gate and is soon on the open road as the radio warns of inclement weather incoming. But she's vibing out to some Lana Del Rey and getting high on the infinite beauty of the natural world. It's only a short jaunt to the convenience store where she acquires all of her necessities and tries to go about her business whilst ignoring the deviant behavior of her fellow patrons. Regardless, she finds herself unexpectedly staring down a scabby-lipped seductress who makes a big deal of the exorbitant prices and substandard quality of the wares on offer. I want a discount. Hey, look, I'll pay. And Justine's desire to avoid confrontation gives the false impression that she's of the elite class. She begins to head home in the foggy night air, analogous to her mood, and very nearly hits her friend's car due to it being stopped on the road. She unnervingly traces a K into the back window, whatever that means. Not desiring to find out, Justine intends to go around them, but has to engage in evasive maneuvers that leverage the superior agility of her vehicle to break free. She arrives at the dorm a little frazzled and does mention it to Wayne so he can be on the lookout, otherwise she'd prefer to just put it behind her. She tries to unwind by catching up on her correspondence with the federal government and unpacks the strenuous experience with her boo. Now Aaron is a man's man so he has a natural inclination to take aggressive action, but she tries to convince him that it's not worth the two-hour drive. 
As she finishes her conversation, Wayne radios out to Dave to let him know to keep an eye out as well. He's got that feeling again, the staticky sensation of something dangerous hanging on the air. Justine wakes up an unknown amount of time later on the scratchy lobby couch. It's probably nothing, but the hairs on the back of her neck are on full alert right now. The foreboding impression is probably not helped by the environment. Just to get it out of her mind, she goes to check in with Wayne and see how that Mountain Dew's treating him. With the way this dorm is set up, you damn near expect a ghost to jump out somewhere. She proceeds, missing some small details that might have been helpful, and creeps down the hall toward an unusual sound off in the distance. The fear, of course, is that it might have been a person creeping about. But it turns out to just be a video of a real-life murder playing on her laptop. <laughs> Whoa, that was close. She sees that Wayne is still alive and well, but she's unable to get his attention due to the torrential downpour outside. Then, aside from this individual website, some sort of hacker has completely cut off all remaining connections. As she tries to troubleshoot, the door begins to slowly open behind her. It appears to just be a draft. But then, as the techno killers remote in, we see her friend's silhouette framed out in the doorway, and she's holding a box cutter. You got it all, Christy. And she's still judging on appearances, which is so frustrating. You'd think we'd know better by now. Justine speeds off, but the front door is now locked, and her pal isn't alone, and her compatriots know how to work commercial junction boxes. They must be some tradies. Wayne finishes his patrol, and they meet back up on opposite sides of the glass. He suffers from tunnel vision, which prevents him from seeing the dirty hoe running up on him with a baseball bat. Wayne must be Christy, I suppose, and as they put their mark on things, they continue to insist that Justine is Christy as well, wafting in her musk just to be sure. Once confirmed, the hunt officially begins, although with no stated rules. It's natural to assume advantage favors the experienced killers, but Justine is a swimmer, and swimmers are very fit. See? She corners herself in a dead end, but is still able to slide out of a slit in the window. She runs to the Union while taking note of her adversary numbers. She views her pursuers as apex predators, kind of like velociraptors, so she treats them as such, taking so many pages from Jurassic Park that she even disappears right before one of them tags her, and diddles some colanders as a distraction while running out. In the parking garage, she proceeds toward the strobing lights of the security SUV. Here she finds that David has been taken care of, and they have confiscated the keys since this isn't their first rodeo. She also finds the emergency lines to be jammed up due to the volume of calls about overzealous dads who drop their turkeys into the fryer too fast. But she stays active in escape, tearing across the quad towards Scott's loner maintenance shack. She tries to instill a sense of urgency in him, but he's taken aback as he and Titus are not used to having company inside their humble domicile. He does have a cell phone, but he wants to take a look for himself. He does not take emergency calls lightly, you see. She sits in her overwhelming intuition that he ain't coming back, but a gentleman never leaves a lady in waiting. He bursts back in with his problem solver to handle the situation. Police will never get here in time. Scott, where's your phone? So why even bother calling, am I right? The security light comes on, announcing their arrival. Scott takes a proactive approach by stepping out into the foggy night and firing off a warning shot that doesn't seem to give them much worry. Titus gets overstimulated and runs out into the open. The fog is too dense to see what's going on, but the sounds that come back to them are not promising. The scuzzos do eventually show themselves, but their appearance is accompanied by the return of a bloody collar that sends Scott back into his shack. I believe under the assumption that they have Titus hostage, because otherwise you take that shot all day, or am I crazy? Also, sound off in the comments on whether the attackers are now just stand-ins for velociraptors, because they just pulled a clever girl on Scott's little ass. Justine is hesitant to move, not knowing the situation, but the motion detector goes off making her think the coast is clear. Instead, she steps out to find a tableau of despair laid out before her. When they menace her with their foil masks, she decides she's had enough and runs off into the night. As she runs, 911 calls back on Scott's cell phone. She requests police backup while informing them that she has key access to the library, so she'll be hiding out in the stacks when they arrive. You honestly couldn't ask for a more compassionate and calming operator on the other end. 
Oh, well, as it turns out, Scotty's number is pasted all over campus, so this was an easy trick to pull off, and they are now closing in on her location. She only has a little bit of time now before entering the final phases of the pursuit, and they commemorate their evening by sending her a little video they edited together of their exploits so far. Unfortunately, playtime is over, and she would really prefer to survive. So she runs upstairs and hides among the many shelves of books as they take a fan formation to try to flush her out. She is very lithe and slippery and is able to use their lights to avoid them. She ultimately uses an alarm on the discarded phone to create a distraction that allows her to reach the stairwell and exit onto the roof. But they were expecting that the whole time. Why are you doing this? Pretty hair. Pretty pot. I feel this could be cleared up with a simple explanation, but they don't provide the opportunity so she takes her chances with gravity. Luckily, the trees have not let down their leaves yet, which helps to break her fall somewhat, and she ends up on the well-lit campus wilderness trail. As she's making her way through, Aaron arrives, not knowing that his lady is no longer lonely. Ya boy can recognize the female form from a mile away, and since Justine is the only resident on campus, he walks right up to her regardless of any bizarre behavior. He responds with only a mild urgency when Justine arrives and warns him away. His lack of seriousness earns him a gutting for his efforts. This reignites her competitive spirit. She finds the rover still has its keys, but one of the boys jumps on the hood and he hooks on there with his tool. She tries, but can't shake him. So instead, she guns it and rams him into a pillar. This makes the vehicle unusable, but gives her insight into her personal capacity to take human life. Thinking strategically now, she ducks into the natatorium in order to bring them into her element. She takes a moment to rummage through Aaron's bag for anything useful, get her mind right, and then she grabs some goggles and ventures out onto the pool deck. The momentary distraction of the door latching closed allows her to slip away. Once she has prepared, she slithers like a snake on her belly into the water. When the lights come in her direction, she fully submerges beneath the surface. She desperately holds her breath, cursing every social cigarette she's ever smoked. Her emergence alerts her pursuer, who circles back in her direction. But she's laid out an intriguing distraction that allows her to pull a self-defense classic before bringing him into her world where the lion learns the true power of the shark. She pulls herself out and takes only a moment for composure before continuing her egress. She stops in the utility room to make some upgrades and personalizations to her new weapon. Meanwhile, the final gentleman finds what's left of his compadre before pursuing Justine into the ladies' locker room. It it takes him a moment to make his way through, since he's only opening his eyes in intervals to make sure he doesn't invade anyone's privacy. When he reaches the end of the line, he can hear her faint whimpers of distress and clearly thinks of himself as the final boss. But he rips back the curtain to discover she's employed her feminine wiles, and then she girl bosses him in the back of the neck. And there's no mercy in this house, so she watches him die slow, even pulling back his mask to reveal his government face so she can connect with it emotionally. Now she has an unjammed phone and is in communication with the final attacker by alluding to being in possession of some good media content depicting the evening. She is granted access to the dark web documents that reveal all of the group's exploits, which are expansive. Now she is pissed and decides to cook up something special for the instigator of all of this. She dons the boy's sweaty mask and clothes, which allows her to run up on the car and cover her assailant in a sort of dry rub. There's a brief standoff, during which Justine lets her know the full extent of the situation she is in, before telling her, add this to your scab collection. And then she ignites her, which actually counts as extra credit for her chemistry class. After all is said and done, she posts her victory to the site in order to rub it in for the other sickos. While it would be ideal to have a series of sequels in which she uses this insider information to track down these cells of cult followers and dispose of them one by one, exposition indicates that she turned the information over to the police. The jury is still out on whether these events and outcomes were better or worse than spending Thanksgiving with your family. My suggestion is to check out this video to see how bad things could actually be, and then be thankful for what you have. Now that we're here, I wanted to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video, and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.